Welcome to the Oracle Apex low-code development demo video. I'm Steve Minch, an architect on the Apex development team, and I'll be your guide for the tour today. We'll start with an end-to-end -end demo of an enterprise web and mobile application for a fictitious medical insurance company called Medipay. Then we'll spend the bulk of our hour together today exploring how the application was built using all the interesting features that Oracle Apex makes available to developers like you. We'll spend the last 15 minutes to educate you on how teams of Apex developers manage and deploy applications like the Metapay one you're about to see. Let me briefly tell you a little bit more about the Metapay application. Customers submit medical expense reimbursement requests along with supporting receipts or other documentation using their mobile phone. Today we'll see what the mobile app looks like on a Samsung M32. Metapay staff use a back office web application, also built with Apex, to review and approve reimbursement claims, support users, and check recent payments processed through a third-party payment service. The system also supports their lead conversion efforts, where agents can work a list of leads from the Metapay marketing department to schedule follow-up Zoom meetings with potential new customers. The same web application also functions as the customer web portal, where they can upload a profile image, set their home address, and configure their preferred reimbursement payment details. In the demo, we'll encounter customers like Jane Barnes and Sally Norton, Metapay back office agents Steve and Vicky, and Apex developers David and Wanda. In addition to being a developer, Wanda also has additional privileges to manage the team's Apex workspace. Behind the scenes, there are six different computers in the demo. The app we'll see is running on the Apex instance the team uses for user acceptance testing. It's on Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Machine 100645 in the Phoenix Data Center. The app uses a third-party payment provider running on an Oracle Autonomous database in the OCI Data Center in Frankfurt, Germany. The leads come from the Metapay Marketing Department's database running on-premises on a Denver Linux server. The team develops on an Apex instance on machine 93781, also in Phoenix, and David the developer uses an Apex instance running on his personal laptop as a standalone environment for feature branch work. Finally, the team's work is source controlled on GitHub. Metapay sends Jane Barnes an email with a link to their new app and she clicks on it on her Android phone. In her Chrome browser on the phone, she logs in, makes sure to tick Remember Me, and clicks Sign In to access the application. She sees an icon in the toolbar to install the web application as a mobile app and clicks on it. After checking out the information cards, she clicks on Install, and her phone notifies her that the Metapay app has been added to her home screen. She goes to her home screen and looks for the new icon. She presses to drag the icon onto her home screen and puts it in position. Long pressing on the icon, she sees some shortcuts that she could click on, or she just taps the icon to open it up. Jane lives in Italy and has a receipt from Prima Medica that she has to enter in the system. She clicks the plus, types the letter P and picks Prima Medica from the list, enters the amount of the receipt, 3595, taps the date control and picks the date when her expense occurred, the 22nd of April. Clicking Next, she sees the screen where she can tap the Upload Your Receipt button to point her camera at her medical receipt to capture it and upload it to the server as documentation of her expense. Back on the home screen, she sees her new request is now awaiting review by Metapay. In the Metapay offices, a staff member, Vicky, is looking at the dashboard and clicks on the claims review and sees that Jane Barnes' expense claim from Prima Medica is in her queue to approve. She clicks on the title to check out the task details. She can see the uploaded receipt. Clicking on the receipt, a dialog opens to show her a full-size image that she can scroll to read the text better. She can also click on the Map tab and check out exactly where in the world the receipt was uploaded from, in this case, Padova, Italy. She actually needs a doctor's note to go along with this receipt, so she notifies the customer to please provide a doctor's note. Jane Barnes' phone vibrates, and she can see the badge with the number one icon on the Metapay app. She looks in her notifications and sees some missing documents for $35.95 and clicks on the details. Missing documentation, please provide doctor's note, she sees, so she clicks add a receipt and uses her camera to scan the doctor's note to go along with the original documentation. A quick tap on Upload provides Metapay with the additional details they need to approve her claim. 
When she next checks her claims review queue, Vicky sees that Jane Barnes' claim is back in her list, and she clicks on the link to check out the additional documentation. She looks at the note, everything looks good, so she claims the task and then proceeds to approve it. Jane Barnes gets a push notification of the approval on her phone, and she checks them to see that the request was approved and sees the check mark on the home page. Another MetaPay customer, Sally Norton, who normally lives in New York, is currently on vacation in Italy. She logs into the MetaPay app on her phone and enters a new reimbursement request from Quest Diagnostics in New York City that happened earlier in the month for 2711 cents. She enters the date and proceeds to upload the expense documentation with her camera. Back on her home screen, she sees an icon that she doesn't recognize. She clicks on it and sees that her document requires verification. It says a confirmation is required because the receipt was uploaded over 500 kilometers away from her home address. So she needs to confirm that it's actually she who is submitting it. Everything looks good now, so she returns to the home screen. Back in Jane Barnes' email, she's gotten a message from MetaPay saying that her payment didn't go through because her payment preference was not configured. She needs to visit the user portal and set it up before the payment will succeed. Jane logs into the user portal and clicks on her profile. On the payment details page, she sees that she can choose debit card and enter her information, or maybe it's better to choose PayPal. Jane underscore Barnes would be the right name. While she's here, she decides to upload a photo, which was missing before, and applies the changes. Checking to make sure the photo loaded correctly, she sees that it did, and actually changes her mind about wanting to instead use a bank wire. So she chooses bank transfer, enters her routing code, and her account number. Jane calls MetaPay to let them know that she's set her payment information, and Vicky takes the call. She searches all the claims for Jane Barnes and Prima Medica and clicks on the approved status to get a closer look. She sees from the business process diagram that the earlier attempt to make a payment was derailed by lack of payment information. She can click retry payment again now to proactively attempt to reprocess the payment. And she could see by the updated diagram that this time the payment succeeded. With Jane still on the phone, out of abundance of caution, Vicky decides to check the recent payments page to make sure that the payment actually did go through. She searches the page for Prima Medica and finds that one of the payments matches the establishment she's looking for. She zooms in, surrounds the red dot, and gets a closer look. The payment was from Prima Medica in Padova. That's exactly the one Jane is talking about. Vicky's boss asks her to prepare a report showing a summary of claims by customer, highlighting claims that have been rejected in the report. They also asked for a pie chart that breaks down the same information graphically for an upcoming presentation, so Vicky gets to work. She clears her previous search and adds a break group based on the claimant. This breaks the claims down by a customer, but Vicky decides it might also be useful to see it further broken down by the facility that was charging the customer. So she edits the break group and adds a second level of breaking, the receipt from and claimant, and now she sees it broken down by both of those factors. In order to see a sum of the receipt amounts, she adds an aggregate to the report, picking the receipt amount and the sum function. Now for each group of customer and receipt source, she sees a summary total. Next, she'll tackle the highlighting that her boss asked for. She's going to format the report with a background color with a condition to only apply that color when the particular claim has a status of rejected. She picks a color and chooses a highlight condition of status 
and having a value of rejected. And once she applies, she instantly sees the effect. Lastly, she'll make quick work of a pie chart that her boss asked for. Under actions, she goes to chart, clicks on pie, picks the claimant and display the receipt amount for each claimant as a sum and apply. Now the same data is presented in a pie chart and she can go back and forth between seeing her formatted report as well as the pie chart. In case she needs to do this again in the future, she's going to save the report called Claims by Claimant so that she'll have this to pick from a menu in the future. She can go back to the primary report and reset it so that she could try additional conditions. Thinking ahead, Vicky decides her boss might not want to see all the claim details, but only the rolled up summary information in the report. Just in case, she quickly prepares a second report that groups the data to present it only in summary. Choosing to group by claimant and then by receipt from, she'll do the sum of the receipt amount and produce a report that just shows the summarized information. When she's not taking customer support calls, Vicki spends time looking at the list of leads from the marketing department on the leads referrals page. Employees from NVIDIA, and maybe Airbnb look like they could be interesting. And wow, there's even one astronaut. Let's pick that one and see. To schedule a meeting with the person she's identified through her faceted search, Vicki can click on the proposed meeting button. A dialog presents a default time on today's date in the next half hour for 30 minutes. Ask her about space. Now the button changed to say view proposed meeting. To adjust the time of the meeting, Vicki can use the lead meetings page where she sees a calendar view and can drag the appointment to a different day or stretch the appointment to last an hour. If she clicks here, the same dialog appears and shows the adjusted times. Back on the leads page, Vicki tries a few different kinds of searches. First, she clears the previous filtering and then tries a multi-word web search and finds an engineer working at Moderna named Bunny Dearman. Next, she tries to search by a salary range and combines that with a particular occupation and finds a few different employees who are waitresses earning between 70 and 200,000. For a final search, she tries to filter on a, the date range to find the, the leads that came in just in the last month, or maybe just in the last week. She combines the date filter with a company filter to find employees in the last week from Twitter. Another agent, Steve at Metapay, checks his queue and sees a claim for approval from Sally Norton, and he clicks to review it. He sees the historical prediction is telling him they've always rejected claims like this in the past. From experience, it's probably due to the customers having chosen only a basic coverage with a minimum copay. So he leaves a message to his colleague Vicky in the task conversation log and decides to give the customer a call. Since the plans change frequently, Steve consults the coverage plans page to review the different available options. Then he checks Sally Norton's current plan. As he suspected, she's on a basic plan with a minimum copay. On the phone with Sally, he goes back and forth as she keeps changing her mind about which plan to pick, but ultimately she decides to stick with the basic plan. While on the phone with Sally, she lets him know she changed her address, so at least he can help her with that. He changes the address to 130 Leonard Street and validates it. The system automatically finds the correct address and the new longitude and latitude, and the address change is complete. Back on the users page, Steve decides that the created and updated dates aren't that interesting to see. He'd rather see the address, city, and country of the customer, as well as their postal code. He adds those to the list of columns to be viewed and removes created and updated, since they're not really adding any value. This change will be, this change will be remembered the next time he logs in as well. Unfortunately, Sally Norton isn't interested in a higher cost plan. So back on the claims review page, Steve edits the approval and delegates the task to Vicki, asking her to take care of it. Vicki gets the job done and rejects the claim.
Every feature you saw in the demo was built using Apex, and nearly all the functionality you witness can be done without code. Let's dive into Apex now and see how apps are developed using this powerful low-code platform. As we look at the different systems involved in implementing the demo using Apex, we'll be using Apex's workspace banner of different colors and titles to help distinguish the different web-based application builders. We'll spend most of the time in the Metapay team's shared development environment, whose banner is this color and whose Metapay development title makes that clear. The Apex system playing the role of our third-party payment processor in Frankfurt has a banner that's this color and its third-party payment provider banner explains this purpose. When we discuss feature branch development later in the hour, the banner on David the developer's private feature branch Apex builder has this color and Metapay feature branch private development title. Toward the end, when we discuss the deployment approaches Apex supports, the user acceptance testing Apex environment running on a different Phoenix data center machine in the Oracle Cloud has a banner of this color. We'll start by looking at how Apex supports team collaboration to capture and manage application requirements. The Apex low-code platform offers a complete and integrated issue tracker integrated right into the environment. It supports issues of different types that can be tagged using custom labels and be organized into milestones and assigned to developers on the team. David logs into the Metapay workspace and clicks on Team Development. He sees a list of the team's issues, some which are already closed. Clicking on his name, he sees a list of the open issues assigned to him, and he decides to investigate issue number seven, customer gallery with photos. He wants to classify this, so he sets some labels to mark it as a bug, mark the functional area as UI UX, and mark it as normal importance, and apply those changes. He intends to fix this feature request in the May sprint, so he's going to set the milestone to be May 22 Sprint. Back on the team's features list, he sees that issue number 7 is now part of the May 22nd Sprint. Let's get a look at the whole Sprint and see what other issues are included. On the Milestones page, he sees the April Sprint is already completed and he drills into the May 22nd Sprint. So far, there's only two issues, and they both belong to David. He drills into the user's confused issue and has a look at the screenshot that talks about an error message that's confusing end users. Back on the issues page, David notices that the customer gallery with photos was tagged incorrectly as a bug. So he's going to use the bulk update functionality to check that bug, click on labels, and then use this dialog to remove the bug label and assign the feature request label. That could be done to one or more issues all in one go. To narrow the list to only show issues that are open, he can apply a filter, choose a column like status, and only filter for those issues where the status equals open. He could eventually save that report and use it again in the future. Next, we'll look at a typical example of how Apex developers build application pages. All the pages you saw in the Metapay demo app were developed using the same visual declarative approach. Both the Create Application Wizard and the Create Page Wizard use artificial intelligence to study data patterns in the tables involved. This allows them to automatically suggest appropriate types of pages or search facets that will provide value to end users. The Visual Page Designer works in tandem with the Runtime Application Developer Toolbar to make jumping back and forth between developing a page and seeing the results of your latest change nearly instantaneous. As we'll see in the demo, the Quick Edit button lets a developer click on anything in a page and jump to immediately edit the appropriate component in the page editor, saving tons of time and clicks. David's been assigned the task of building a customer gallery with photos, so he wants to get started. If he were tasked to create a new application, he could use the Create Application Wizard to enter a name and configure a set of initial pages related to tables of interest. Each page can choose from 16 common data-savvy UX patterns. After setting up those initial pages, he could select a set of built-in features to include, like progressive web app, access control, theme selection, end-user feedback, activity reporting, 
and pages for app configuration and an about box. But David needs to add one additional page to the existing MetaPay app, so he cancels the wizard to go do that. He clicks on the MetaPay desk application and clicks Create Page. In the Create Page wizard, since he wants to build a page with cards that allow a smart filtering capability that end users love, he selects a smart filter page that offers a cards option. He enters Customer Gallery for the name of the page and Med Users for the name of the table, then clicks Next. He chooses to display the data as cards and considers the suggested search facets the wizard proposes after studying the data patterns in the underlying table. He unselects the facets for the row version and home latitude and includes the customer's preferred payment method, then clicks Next again. On the last page of the wizard, he leaves the default grid layout for the cards and keeps the suggested columns to use the username as the title of the card and the country as the body. Then he clicks Create Page. He immediately runs the page to see what he gets. He gets the basic cards page with title and body that includes an order by page item to allow the user to sort by username or country. Next, he'll configure the card's media attribute to use the photo column in the Med Users table that stores the customer's profile photo in a blob. He sets the developer toolbar to stay visible and clicks on Quick Edit. He clicks on the Attributes tab and searches for media. Chooses a blob column as the media source and chooses the photo column as the column name. By setting an updated column, it can automatically cache the images. Trying to run the page, we get an error that says the primary key needs to be set. So we go set the ID column and rerun again. Now we see the images on the cards. We do a quick edit again to go back to edit the search facet of the Smart Filters region. We select the column names that are included in the row search so that we can use those column names to remind us of what additional information we could include on the card. By selecting the card, we can configure how its attributes are set. David wants to move the country name from the body down to the secondary body so that he can use the body to show more information in advanced formatting. Clicks on the editor and pastes in the name of all the columns, which he can refer to by name using an ampersand and a dot to use as substitution parameters. He wants to show the address first, so he adds an ampersand before address and a dot after it. Then he repeats the same for all the other fields he wants and clicks OK. If we rerun the page now, we'll see that now the complete address information shows up in the body of the card. When we look at the order by drop-down list, we see the name of the country shows as country L$3, which is a name that Apex created when it automatically joined in the user-friendly country name to complement the two-letter country code in the country column. To fix the label, David clicks again on the Quick Edit button, then clicks on the order by select list. It appears directly in the editor so we can search for list and click on the static values to quickly adjust the display value name to be country. Lastly, David wants to make clicking on the card open the profile page. Right clicking on actions, he can create a button whose type is full card. Clicking on no link to find, he can quickly choose the user profile page from the page link builder. Pick which parameter should be set to give the ID of the user, that's P11 underscore ID, and the value to provide is ID in the current page. Clicking OK, we've now set up a page navigation. David runs the page to see the final result. Clicking on a card like Jane Barnes now opens the user profile. David tries out some of the other functionality built into this page. Choosing username from the order by select list or country sorts by those fields. He can use the Smart Filters region to search by one of the facets, like the coverage plan, find users that have the basic plan. Facets can be combined to choose 
basic users who live in Italy. He can clear those and try other kinds of multi-word searches, like trying to find a user with the name that matches Sally New York, finds text in any of the fields in any order as they appear in the card. One of Apex's superpowers is that your applications run right inside the database and have access to all of its features. Apex's SQL Workshop gives developers all the tools they need to create and modify tables, views, functions, procedures, packages, and all other schema objects. The SQL Commands window lets users perform quick tests of SQL statements, peel SQL blocks, or server-side JavaScript code. And QuickSQL makes quick work of designing and evolving database schemas, and the data generator and data loader round out the toolset for creating sample data for testing and importing and exporting data from Excel, CSV, JSON, or XML formats. David was just working with the med users table. So in the SQL workshop, the object browser lets us search for med and quickly select the med users table to see its structure, its data, and any other aspect involved in the table's definition. The SQL commands window allows us to run SQL statements like a query against the med users table. If the query contains bind variables, a form pops up to capture the values, and results show below. We can choose PLSQL and paste in a PLSQL block that runs the same query but in a loop inside the programming language. Output is shown in the results window below. Similarly, server-side JavaScript, we can paste in a script and run a SQL query in JavaScript code. To design tables, we use QuickSQL. It gives us a simple text format for expressing the names of tables and columns, easily representing the data types, and for example, adding a new field is simply a matter of typing a few characters and clicking the Generate button. In a future release, we intend to provide a visual schema diagrammer to complement the text-based Quick SQL Editor. This will allow users to design tables either visually or textually and keep both in sync. The built-in data generator allows you to create sample data for testing. In the MetaPay demo, the lead referrals data that we eventually loaded into our Denver Marketing Team database was originally generated with the data generator. It includes custom data sources, SQL function-based data sources, so I could calculate the a normalized distribution of children, a, many, many built-in categories of uh, domains that can generate uh, things like company names and emails and addresses, very useful. The data workshop allows you to drag and drop CSV files, Excel, JSON, or XML, and easily parse and load their data into the database. All you need to do is provide a table name, and if necessary, map columns if they can't be mapped automatically, and click on the Load Data button. In short order, all the rows in those files get loaded into your new or existing tables. You can quickly jump to the object browser and check out the data that we just loaded from the data generator created CSV file. Apex offers two kinds of support for modeling and executing business processes that might change over time and a built-in way of automating repetitive data tasks. Users familiar with the BPMN 2.0 standard will find rich support in flows for Apex, which was used to model the payment process in the MetaPay demo. Human approvals of any kind can be tackled declaratively with the Apex approvals components. Let's look first at the task definition in the MetaPay demo that's used for the claim approval human task. In shared components, under task definitions, we click on claim approval. We see it defines a subject, priority, and interval for calculating the due date, a task details page to navigate to the details, 
an action SQL query to provide additional data for actions. The approvers and the admins can be determined statically or dynamically. Any number of parameters can be supported. And actions have eight different events where code or emails can be executed. For example, in the MetaPay demo, this small block of PLSQL code kicks off the flows for Apex process. In addition to supporting the execution of human task approvals, Apex also provides a unified task list, which is a type of page you can create to show users an inbox of three different styles of task lists. In addition, Apex can generate task details pages that can be easily extended to include machine learning or other custom details along with the generated page. This is the simple SQL query used by the task details page in the MetaPay demo to predict the probability that a particular claim will be approved or rejected. We use Oracle's machine learning AutoML to pick an algorithm and then include the SQL query to run the prediction as part of our task details page. Flows for Apex is an open source BPMN 2.0 tool partially funded by Oracle for its development. And it installs in seconds in the Apex Builder environment. It provides tools for managing and monitoring BPMN 2.0 business processes. We'll look at the payment processing model used in the MetaPay demo. Clicking Modify Diagram, we're brought into the Visual Designer where we can see the payment process used in the demo. Script tasks can invoke PLSQL, perhaps written in PLSQL packages, or written as blocks of PLSQL code directly in the script task. Here's the small amount of code required to set the variables to control the routing based on whether a user has configured their preferred payment option or not. The payment is this small amount of code that calls a package function to hide the details of how the payment is actually made from the business developer. The flow monitor allows you to look at all existing task instances and look at a visual representation of the state that they're in. If a business process task instance has gotten stuck, the monitor tool allows the user to intervene and restart the task. Very often, applications require exposing functionality to other applications. Oracle Apex makes this easy to do with a one-click auto-rest capability for schema objects and a full RESTful service designer to allow building services that have more complex requirements. This is the Frankfurt-based Apex instance we used for the third-party payment processing in the demo. The payment info table was enabled as a REST service by simply clicking yes on the REST enable object in the object browser. To create the more complicated service that might require custom functionality, in addition to the get service that was created in the auto REST, we've created the post service using the RESTful Services Designer. This small block of code retrieves specific parameters out of a submitted JSON document, invokes the payment processing dot pro process payment procedure, and then returns the transaction ID in the response JSON. The roles and privileges can also be managed directly from this environment that control the authorization for who can access the service. The payment info is the name of the module that's protected, and we can also protect URL patterns. The payment info module can also generate a Swagger document whose URL we can copy and use with any third-party tools that understand Swagger to either document the service or generate code in some cases based on the structure represented in the Swagger. Apex offers extensive support for integrating data from remote databases, websites, and applications using REST. REST data sources allow all of Apex's powerful data components to work equally well against remote data, and local post-processing lets you easily blend local and remote data in your applications. 
These features came in handy in the MetaPay demo for the third-party payment processing and for the leads referrals from the marketing department. In addition, REST synchronizations with a few clicks allow you to locally cache REST data on a periodic schedule and REST catalogs allow you to package or reuse sets of interfaces without requiring low-code developers to understand how to set up the services. The MetaPay desk application uses two key REST data sources, one for the payments and one for the lead referrals. We'll look at the payments one first. That's going against the server in Frankfurt and is using the auto-enabled REST service to get the payment information for the latest payments being processed. The authentication uses OAuth 2.0, and we can click this button to test the service and see the data come back live to make sure the connection is established correctly. The synchronization is configured to go to the recent payments cache table when the synchronization is processed according to its schedule. Once every hour on the five minutes after the hour. In the recent payments page, the map shows the information retrieved from the REST service in a layer using the red dots. With the debug tool, Apex can show us the log of all the information going on inside the server when the application page is running, and we see it's making a GET request to the server in Frankfurt. If we edit this page, we can enable the feature called Use Synchronization Table. If we turn that on, then our user interface, when the application runs, will use the data in the cached local table instead. If we revisit the Recent Payments page after changing that property, viewing the debug, information will now show that there is no Frankfurt present in the log file because instead of fetching the data over REST, we're now querying directly the recent cash payments table. Next, we'll look at the Denver Oracle Database Server. It's set up as a REST-enabled SQL endpoint using ORDS. The lead referrals is set up similarly as a REST data source going against the ORDS endpoint. And the REST enabled SQL query can be arbitrarily complicated, but for the demo is simply select star from lead referrals. The synchronization is also configured to be periodically refreshed and cached locally. And this uses a different authentication scheme instead of OAuth2, it's just using the username password. The test shows us that the data is being retrieved. It's used in the demo on the lead referrals page. It's a faceted search with all the same functionality that works against a local Oracle database, like facets for astronaut and retrieving information about the users. In this case, let's do a quick test back on the Denver server, den00ORD. We're logged into the database on the command line using SQL CL. We'll do a simple update for the employee on the card shown before, Selena Broadwell. We'll set her salary to 999-999 and go back to the page. And refresh the data by unclicking and re-clicking the astronaut occupation value. And we see now that the live data is being fetched from the remote database. Other features like multi-word web search, if we search for Sal Broad Zoom, it'll find anything in the database as long as the terms match in any order. Apex knows how to send the appropriate SQL depend, regardless of the features that you're using from the data savvy UX components that Apex provides.
the local post-processing allows us to join data from the REST data source using the special token hash apex dollar source data included as one table in a possible set of joins. You can join that with local data to connect with additional information, augment using SQL functions, or format however your application requires. Apex provides automatic state management that dramatically simplifies one of the fundamental complexities of web application development and provides built-in features like processes, dynamic actions, validations, branches, and both client-side and server-side conditions to give low-code developers a wide array of solutions to accomplish typical application business logic. Let's study a few examples from the Metapay demo. The user profile page uses JavaScript on the server as a process during page load to initialize the value of the current user if one is not provided. The form initialization process is one of many built-in kinds that Apex provides to take care of functionality in the product, both human tasks, flows for Apex, data loading, and many others. Other examples in this page, when typing in a new address on the tab for the user profile, when we click validate, a dynamic action triggers the geocoding, which is a built-in feature. The developer simply picks the action from the list to execute the built-in functionality. When the automatic geocoding successfully geocodes an address, we can respond to that custom event that's built in to automatically populate other fields in our form, like the new longitude and new latitude fields with the value from the JavaScript event. This kind of one line JavaScript expressions are things that even low code developers can tackle. Another example shows on the payment details tab when changing the value of the payment method from bank to PayPal and such causes the hiding and showing of the other related fields below. That's accomplished using client-side conditions so that, for example, when the payment method equals PayPal, we show the PayPal name field. And if it's not equal to PayPal, we hide that field. Similar show and hide Actions are configured for the de debit card number and the bank account number and routing number. And these simple actions are configured with clicks rather than code to do sophisticated dynamic client side functionality with great ease. Further Java server side code is in the processes that execute when the form is submitted so that any unrelevant bank and payment details are cleared out. And the automatic process that handles the form submission is one of the built-in form DML processing ones. Apex provides sample applications for users to learn from and four starter apps that all illustrate many best practices. The vibrant Apex community includes many developers and companies that create reusable components for Apex called plugins. These components allow Apex developers to incorporate working components of many different varieties into their applications without having to be familiar with the implementation details. The Metapay demo used three interesting plugins, one to resize images on the client side to reduce data transfer costs and avoid having to store the multi-megapixel images that today's mobile phones are capable of taking. Capturing the mobile device's GPS coordinates was done using another plugin and the visual display of the flows for Apex payment processing model was the third one. The Apex.world website is the home base for finding Apex plugins. Some are open source and free, and others have purchase or support costs. The most popular kind of plugin are the dynamic action type, but there are also many kinds of custom regions, items, and processes. Low-code developers and professional developers can cooperate easily in the Apex environment. Pro coders can author reusable libraries of functionality in PLSQL or JavaScript as packages or modules, respectively, and Apex plugins are another mechanism for more technical developers to give low coders declaratively configured components that can accomplish amazing things.
Business analysts familiar with BPMN can employ flows for Apex for business processes that might be changing frequently, and they can easily invoke PLSQL packages that hide the implementation details from them to accomplish useful business logic tasks. For example, that's exactly how the payment processing model worked in the Metapay demo. Apex developers test their application code using popular frameworks like UT PLSQL, Postman, and Selenium. Internal teams at Oracle building applications with Apex number in the tens of thousands of developers, and they employ all these three testing frameworks in their work every day. In the remainder of our time, we'll explore how Apex applications are managed and deployed. Let's get started. When Apex workspace administrators define new users, they're defining an application stakeholder. They have complete control over the access rights that every user has to the system, indicating whether the user is a developer, and if so, whether they have access to the app builder, the SQL workshop, and team development. Users who have none of the developer privileges are simply known as end users of your Apex application. A developer's account or an entire workspace can be locked if the administrator needs to as well. While the workspace administrator has access to all workspace activity monitoring and logging information, developers like David get a narrower set of information that's still useful for them to get their jobs done. Apex provides workspace administrators with extensive insight and oversight, making it easier to track more stakeholders building more apps. They can manage builder access by workspace and user, monitor developers and end user activity by application, use instrumentation to identify problems and bottlenecks, and combine Apex automation features with the data dictionary that exposes all the information about the logging and metrics to provide custom reports about problems at hand. Finding information about the dependencies between application components is also easy to build because of the data dictionary availability of information. This is an example of an Apex application built by a member of the Apex team that looks at the dictionary of information about application metadata and determines the components in use in the application and how many lines of code have been written and in which languages. I ran it against the Metapay application to find that almost 80% of the application logic is implemented in declarative SQL and only 20% in PLSQL with a minimal fraction in JavaScript. Next, let's explore how the Metapay demo has put Apex's application security features into practice. Apex offers extensive built-in support for 10 different authentication schemes and makes it possible to build custom schemes when the built-in options don't meet your needs. A flexible mechanism for defining authorization schemes makes it easy to ensure that entire applications, individual pages, or down to the item, column, or menu list entry are only usable by the set of users whom you intend to interact with them. Access control list functionality is configured in the builder and can be configured as part of your app by adding the feature pages with a single click. When your application needs to control which rows individual users see, the easiest way to do that is using the database's virtual private database capability, which the Metapay demo does to ensure individual customers can only see their own claims. In the Metapay demo, let's look at the shared components where the authorization schemes are defined. The demo uses two schemes, one for MetaPay customers and the other for MetaPay staff members. In the application access control area, you can define which users are members of which schemes. So our example.org users are the end customers and Vicky and Steve are members of staff. In the All Claims page, we have some columns in a particular table which are marked to be visible only to staff members. Things that may not make any sense for end users, like the audit columns and the row version, should be not even visible to the end users. And we can do that just by setting the authorization scheme on those columns.
in the dashboard page, we have a region top claimants last year, which is again configured with the authorization scheme of MetaPay staff member. That makes, makes sure that when an end user logs in, they don't see that particular chart since it contains information that's not relevant. And the navigation menu that shows on the left-hand side contains entries that also can be secured with the authorization scheme. Many of the options which the back office users see are not available to the end users. When developing applications, Apex users enjoy automated backups so they can always restore their work if something should go wrong. Developers can work productively much of the time on a shared instance where components can be locked so other colleagues don't modify them at the same time. Complete change history reports are available as part of the tool to see what developers have changed what, and other less glamorous but necessary aspects of the application development lifecycle, like multilingual application facilities and accessibility are built in. Lastly, Apex makes it incredibly simple to deploy an application from one environment to another with remote deployment support right in the App Builder. But it's also easy to integrate Apex with external source code control environments like Git. You can export applications or components as readable text files and import them into other environments. Apex provides command line tools to allow scriptable DevOps, so whatever CI CD process your company has adopted will be able to embrace Apex development artifacts and applications with ease. For performing security analysis of code, the same command line tools can export only the code of your application so your SQL, PL-SQL, or JavaScript can be validated or security vetted using third-party tools. And for larger feature projects where developers prefer to work in their own private environment, Apex supports feature branch development using pluggable databases or Oracle XE as private environments for individual developers. Let's look at a Git development scenario. Earlier, David built the customer gallery page but if we switch to the user acceptance testing environment, we see that the page is not there. If we go to the server in Phoenix that's the development team machine and run the apex to git command, that takes the application from apex and copies that to the git repository on the local file system. The Visual Studio code running in the same machine instantly picks up the diffs in the Git repository, and we can click on individual files to see the customer gallery page is brand new. We had adjusted the use synchronization table property to true in another page, and from true to false in a different example in page 13. The lists, we defined an additional entry for the FA table search and LOVs were two items I created before recording the demo. All of the individual changes are easily visible in the exported YAML. We can type a commit message, like MetaPay demo work, commit to the Git repository on our Phoenix machine. Next, we'll push our changes up to the GitHub from the MetaPay test Git repository. The status shows that we need to push, and we now do the Git push and push that up to GitHub. In order to deploy the new page and these other small changes to the UAT server, we can run the git to apex command. That pushes the, in the application from the Git repository into the UAT server. And if we switch over to the user acceptance testing and refresh the app builder, we'll now see that the customer gallery page is there. So we've deployed from command line the changes that we made earlier in the demo over to the UAT environment. Now let's look at a feature branch development scenario. On the team server, David indicates that he's completed the customer gallery with photos feature. And now he moves on to work on the bug that users are confused that it says no rows retrieved in the claims review page.
With feature branch development, David pulls the latest version of the team application from GitHub and creates himself a branch to work in. He uses his local Apex running on his laptop to make those changes, and after doing his testing, commits his branch and pushes it back to the GitHub server. He creates a pull request, and then team members discuss the code before the code is merged to the team trunk line or main. On the team server, they pull the changes that have been merged into the main and import them into the team development environment. And from there, the application can be remote deployed to UAT or to production when necessary. David starts the process by doing a git pull to get the latest team development version onto his local repo area. A git checkout dash b metapay dash six is the command he runs to create himself a branch based on the ticket number six in the team development system in Apex. Running git to Apex, he installs his local repo into his Apex running on his laptop environment. On his local laptop Apex installation, David edits the Metapay application, runs the claims review page and sees the problem, no rows retrieved. Kind of confusing. He clicks quick edit and goes directly to the claims review page, right to the My Tasks report region where he can search for no row and find the when no data found. He types no claims to review to improve the message. And while he's there, he decides he probably wants to also change the icon. So first he saves the page, goes over to the navigation menu under shared components and sees what icon the menu for the page is using. The claims review page is using an icon named FA-Tasks. So he copies that to his clipboard and clicks the edit page four button to go back right back where he was working before. Clicking on the region again, he searches for no in the attributes tab, finds the no data found icon and enters the matching FA tasks. Running the app, he now sees he's fixed the bug with a better icon. David exports the changes he's made using Apex to Git that copy them to his local Git repo on his file system. He does Git commit to commit the transaction and Git push with the dash U for upstream flag to push the branch up into the GitHub server. Up on the GitHub site, David opens a pull request, asking his colleagues to review his code. Once they've done that, they can merge the pull request when everything's OK. He confirms the merge. And now his changes are merged to the main branch. On the Phoenix Oracle Cloud team development Apex environment, the administrator runs git pull to pull the latest changes, including David's feature branch, down to the team server, and then runs git to Apex to import the changes into the local development environment. To validate his change, David searches no claims to review in the MetaPay desk application in the team development environment. And the application-wide search feature in Apex shows him there's one occurrence, and it's exactly the place he changed it in the attributes of that particular card. And he sees his changes made it to the team server. Final step involves deploying remotely to the user acceptance testing. We'll use the remote deployment feature that Apex has built in, picking the test UAT environment from the pre-configured endpoints. Clicking Next. And on this page, we need to set the overwrite existing application since there's a previous version already in UAT. 
This deploys the application right from the browser with one click. In the app builder, in the user acceptance testing environment, we can go check to see if David changes there in the claims page. Click on the region. In the attributes section, search for no and no claims to review with the FA tasks icon is now in UAT. Oracle Apex is unique among low-code platforms to support deployment of applications both on-premises to the Oracle Cloud as well as third-party clouds. Oracle provides options that are both free as well as managed cost options in the cloud. Apex runs on all different configurations of the Oracle database. All Oracle editions, including Exadata and the free Oracle XE environment which is great for local development. But Apex especially shines when running on Oracle Autonomous Database. In that environment, low-code developers can completely focus on just delivering apps and don't have to worry about any other details involved in running their application or running their development environments. The Autonomous Database is pre-configured, keeps track of all updates and applies them automatically, self-upgrading, and can auto-scale as the load changes on the system. Simple to manage and monitor, and recovery and failover is all built into the platform. By writing applications on Apex on Oracle Cloud with the autonomous database, a number of additional OCI services make building your applications especially interesting Features like OCI object storage, OCI email delivery, OCI vault, data safe, machine learning, and many other services are all instantly available by running in the autonomous database in the cloud. Lastly, let's briefly mention some items that we're investing in for future versions of Apex. We just saw how using command line tools, we're able to integrate with lifecycle management CICD pipelines, but we're investing effort in improving the integration directly in the builder for working with tools like Oracle OCI DevOps, GitHub, and GitLab. So developers not comfortable or not familiar with command line tools will have an easier time working with those industry standard mechanisms. We showed an example of the visual schema building that we're investigating, and we're also working on workflow and business logic diagramming to s allow developers to have a visual way to create common business logic by connecting shapes and lines and setting conditions in a very declarative way as an alternative to writing code. We saw the rich REST capabilities that Apex currently has, and we're investing further in providing additional adapters to connect to Postgres and Microsoft SQL in the future, and, and pre-configured REST catalogs for Oracle Fusion Apps, Salesforce, SAP, and others to make integrating with those applications much easier for low-code developers. And finally, trying to democratize the use of the powerful machine learning capabilities of the Oracle database by adding additional features into Apex to simplify the creation of the prediction models based on the historical data that the algorithms need for their training. So with that, our tour of Apex is complete. Thank you for spending an hour with us to learn more about our product. For more information, visit apex.oracle.com, where you can request a free workspace to evaluate all the features of the product you've seen in this demo, as well as access the product documentation, hands-on labs, and other resources about training, partners and consulting companies offering Apex services, Apex community conferences, and more.